Contessa Brewer Hello? of MSNBC. Hello? <laughs> All right, well, Contessa, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your career, kind of introduce you to, uh, to folks and find out more uh, about how you got to where you are. Obviously, you anchor on MSNBC now. And uh, so just tell me uh, first how you got started in this career in the first place. Um, well, back in the day, I rode across the country in a covered wagon. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I went to Syracuse where they had a broadcast journalism program that happens to be highly regarded. And I was very fortunate to have a great education. And uh, I went to um, Reno to see my college girlfriend right after graduation and went to go see the news directors there. And one of them offered me a job. Uh, although I did have to lug around about 100 pounds of equipment, you know, cable reels and camera and tripod and batteries. And, you know, I remember in the middle of a blizzard um, up in the Sierra Nevada mountains, climbing up on top of the truck and unsticking the frozen microwave dish to engineer my own live shot and then standing in front of the camera for those early morning live shots. So it was, you know, it was, it was pretty, they got a lot of work out of me back in those days. Yeah, you know, I did a lot more for eight twenty-five an hour than I do now. Well, you see, that's also interesting. So now, for uh, those of you who aren't familiar, Syracuse is basically the best broadcasting school in the country. And that's right, it is. <laughs> and about half the guys you see on TV are from Syracuse, and so it's an amazing school. But you come out of there, you got to start at a small market like Reno, and when you start, uh, you know, you're doing all the stuff yourself in a, in a lot of ways. But I think people don't know how little those local reporters make. Were you literally making eight twenty-five an hour? Yeah, yeah, I was being very honest there, and I considered myself lucky to make that because there were people who would go to like, um, okay, so Reno is about the halfway point between how big a market can get and how small it can get. So I considered myself lucky to start in Reno because, after all, it is the biggest little city in the world. <laughs> There's a sign that says so downtown. Literally, and, yeah, that's right. Yes, literally. And, um, and I was the only one-man band in that city. So, I mean, we, were, we had live trucks. There were a lot of kids who I graduated with who went to, say, for instance, Grand Junction, Colorado, who were making $14,000 a year. And, you know, they were basically starving. And, and, and every year that survey comes out about what new graduates are going to make, and reporters are always down way below nurses and teachers and and used car salesmen. Yeah, my uh, the other guy who hosts the show is Ben Mankiewicz, and he started in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and he was making eighteen thousand a year when he started. Yeah, see, Charleston's a big city. Yeah, tra and Charleston, when you're starting out. Right, exactly, and you know he felt really lucky to be starting in Charleston. So at at that point, how old were you? Were you just out of school, twenty two years old, or yeah, I was twenty two. Yeah. Okay. So and then what? So what was the next step? Where did you go from Reno? Then I went to Palm Springs, California, which was awesome um, because <laughs> I was living in you know basically a suburb of L A. and I was meeting all these cool. I was I had a boyfriend in L A. at the time, and I, so I'd go back to, and forth to L A. And I was meeting all these incredible people. I mean, I met um, Sonny Bono. I interviewed Sonny Bono several times before that. I interviewed Frank Sinatra. I interviewed Harry Carey. And then, of course, he passed away. So I don't know that there was any correlation between me interviewing these people and then <laughs> them dying. But uh, it was problematic, for sure. <laughs> I'm glad I'm interviewing <laughs> you and you're not interviewing me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So how long um, did that take between Reno and Palm Springs? How long did you spend in Reno? Uh, I spent 13 months in Reno. Oh, that's cool. Not a second too soon did I leave. And that was hard work. I mean, that, the manual labor part of that job was very discouraging. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, when you're a girl trying to wear high heels, and, and my makeup weighed probably 15 pounds, and so I'm carrying that in batteries and a tripod and all that. It, I mean, literally, this was hard manual labor. That was a vocation. And so when I got the anchoring job in Palm Springs, I was, and they had photographers who were going to shoot for me, I was like, yes, this is it. But even then, I was producing my own show. I was editing all the videotape. Um, 
I was managing the crews on the weekends. So I basically have done every job in the newsroom except the job of boss. I've never actually been the boss. <laughs> right. Uh, so what um, from Palm Springs, how long do you stay there as an anchor, and then where do you go after that? I stayed in Palm Springs for about two years, and then, I, and then my station was bought, and I moved to my, the station was bought by a company based out of Milwaukee, and they said, we want to keep you um, if we offer, offer you an anchor job in Milwaukee, would you go? And I said, yes, because that was a jump from like, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think Palm Springs at the time was market 159, and Milwaukee was market 33. So it was a major market jump to go there, and they tripled my salary. Wow. So, um, okay. so I moved to Milwaukee, and what I learned was, you know, in California, I really became a California girl. I loved it. I was fit and, and tan, and I loved my life. I went to Milwaukee, and I froze my little tush off. And I thought, you know, I looked around, and I was like, well, no wonder people in Milwaukee carry a little extra layer of fat, because if you don't, you'll freeze out here. <laughs> and they had me standing out in the snow and the ice and the sleet and all of that. So, can, can so you say, um, I very quickly in Milwaukee, A, gained, I don't know, 5, 10 pounds, and B, learned to love the Packers, because if you don't, you will die. So are you still a Packers fan? Yes, you have to be, except I will admit, my loyalty is divided now because I love Brett Favre so much that I followed him to the Jets and then to the um, Minnesota Vikings, and I'm feeling a little, what's the word, for clumped about all of the hardship and obstacles he's gone through the last year or so. So those uh, text pictures didn't dissuade you from being a fan of Brett Favre? I didn't. I never looked at them, so I don't know if it's actually him. Okay, all right. So I like that. If you don't see it, they don't exist. Clearly, it's entirely possible that he was a big, phenomenal athlete who was taken for a ride. It's possible. Uh -huh. I, you know, I want to keep the jury out. I hear you. I hear you. So the reason I, I like this story is because I think a lot of people don't know, you know, how reporters go up the chain and how that works. And every reporter in the country like knows the size of each city because you know you move from 159 to 33, right. et cetera. In, in, Syracuse, New York, number 74. I, I remember because I worked in radio, and I remember one of the first uh, job possibilities that I had was in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, you know, which was very Please. small. Which is very small, but uh, it had the distinction of uh, having Sean Hannity's, like the, the radio station I was going to be on was Sean Hannity's first radio station. And Who? <laughs> exactly. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, I kid because I love. Well, back then I was a, a conservative talk show host, but they sniffed me out and they knew that I wasn't really a conservative because I didn't even own a shotgun. So they're like, what? <laughs> How can you live in Alabama and not own a shotgun? Yeah, well, so they, they wound you, up not wait, hiring. Didn't you need them to keep the, uh, or the white Aryan nation away? Well, I certainly would have needed that, yes. Um, so, okay, so and did you get all this stuff with an agent or without an agent? How do you make those No, I, I, all, everything that I've told you up until that point was done without an agent. And then in Milwaukee, you're, you know, that's a huge market. And so at that point, did an agent come to you and say, all right, Contessa, let's make this thing happen. Let's yeah, I mean, at that point, then, then I, had, um, I, I was talking to a couple of different agents who wanted to represent me and thought that they could help me grow my career. And even earlier in my career, there had been agents who, you know, who would have been willing to represent me. But at that point, if you're making so little money. I mean, I, just in Palm Springs, my first year in Palm Springs, I made twenty six thousand dollars a year. And then for an agent to go and want to take a percentage of that, it just didn't. It did not make a lot of sense to me. A lot of what it took to move your career along at that point was persistence and a willingness to save your own tape and send it out to people. Um, and so I got really good at job hunting. Well, then once I was in Milwaukee, and you really want to. You, you know, you you want to move your career in a way that may be um, way more competitive. At that point, I got an agent. And the weird, you know, the thing is, um, at that point, too, my contract was coming up in Milwaukee. My sister is in the Navy to this day. And at the time, she had just been newly stationed outside of Seattle. And her husband was deployed to sea. The Iraq War had just begun. And um, my sister was 
having a baby and was due any day. And my news director said to me, you know, hey, do you want to sign a new multi-year contract? And I, I just was looking at it, and my sister was all alone. She'd, she'd been stationed in this place where she didn't know anybody and had any friends. And I said, you know, I think I need to go out with my sister. Mm-hmm. So I moved out to see... Well, I didn't know that I had moved, but I gave up my apartment, and I left my car in Milwaukee, and I went out to help my sister have this baby. And three months later, she got deployment orders, and she was like, hey, you know, you've got to take my nursing baby and take care of her. And so I went around in Seattle, and I was asking, you know, all of the news directors at all four stations in Seattle said, we'll give you freelance work. They were all four stations were phenomenal. But the NBC station there actually sent a reporter out to do a story on, you know, me leaving my job and my sister um, deploying when her husband was already deployed, and it caused, I think, a little bit of a, a ruckus in that area, and people you know, called complaining about deploying breastfeeding moms, and um, my sister and the other nursing mothers from her naval hospital ended up not having to deploy. But then what happened was nobody wanted to hire. So, I mean, here I had really, I would worked my butt off to be in this industry and to have the career that I had. And all of a sudden, I'm like a stay-at-home mom. I'm taking care of this, this baby, and uh, my sister was back, you know, on, on duty, and and going to work every day, and I could not get work. I could not, for the life of me, land a job. You know, the stations, because the economy was bad, had put hiring freezes in place. And there was a guy out in L.A. who actually said to me, you know, it's a lot easier to get a job if you have a job. I'm thinking, well, you know, I know that now, but when the blinking arrow is pointing you down a certain path, it seems like you should follow that path. So, you know, the, what it, year were it, you in Seattle, Contessa? I'm sorry, what? What year were you in Seattle then? That was in, um, that was in the end of 2002, the beginning of 2003. Right, okay. And, and, and so I'm traveling around the country. I've got a few freelance gigs. I was, I was collecting unemployment, um, which was really difficult. Really, really, I mean, you know, the, you'd call the unemployment office, and the, the unemployment people wanted to know, um, have you shown up for job training classes? I'm thinking, well, I'm trained in my career. I know the job that I want, and yes, I'm applying for jobs, and yes, and they wanted to know they wanted to know details about what interviews have you been on. And I tried explaining to them, you know, that I'm in a really specialized industry, and that my interviews require me to travel, and you know, it, it's really in unemployment. And this is the thing that we don't talk a lot about on the news, but it's a really defeating, discouraging process. I mean, to go in and get that unemployment check is just... And, and it's, it was for a fraction of what I had been earning. I mean, it did not... It, it covered my bills, but only because I had given up my apartment. I was living with my sister for free, and I was making her pay for all the groceries. I mean, I wasn't paying for anything at that point. You know, Contessa, with that background, isn't it kind of comical when people say, some politicians say, Oh, you know what? Uh, these people on unemployment are just milking the system, and they don't want to get work. They just want to live off of unemployment. It was, you know what? It was awful. It's awful for me to do that. And I don't talk, you know, Jenk. I don't really talk about that on the air um, about the time that I was unemployed, and I don't talk about the fact that when I got an offer from MSNBC, and MSNBC didn't know this. I mean, my agent was good. He didn't tell them, "Hey, she's about to lose unemployment," but. I was running out of employment about the same week I got an offer from MSNBC. And I thought at that point I was going to have to go get a job at Marshalls or TJ Maxx and, and you know, be on the floor stocking clothes. Yeah. Because can, I, can I, I just tell you something, Inessa? I, I was in almost the exact situation in the year 2000. I was on unemployment after our station in Miami closed down. And I was trying to get a job in New York or LA as a TV writer, which is what I was working at as at the time. And I went and applied to become a substitute teacher. And you know, and I had to go through the same thing where did you go to and apply to jobs? Did you da da da? And I'm like, but I'm a TV writer. They're like, who cares? And then and then I found out I wasn't qualified to be a substitute teacher. <laughs> and and then <laughs> and then I got a job as a writer in LA, and, and things worked out. But you know, because it happens to all of us, and that's the whole point of these programs. Is to get us. Well, and you know, I don't know about you, but 
I've always felt like things happen for a reason and that the reason I needed to go through that period of unemployment was so that I was available for the big job at MSNBC. I mean, that was a huge, huge career leap. But now I'm looking at people who've been out of work for a year or a year and a half or two years, and I'm thinking, well, maybe things don't always work out the way they're supposed to. I mean, I was just talking tonight with a friend of mine whose dad was very successful and, you know, and comfortable and because of the bad economy and some bad luck and some health issues in his own life, is not he's not making money anymore. And they're they're really in dire straits. And it just was eye opening that things don't always work out. I mean things don't always turn up rosy. Yeah. And that safety net I mean I can't I mean, the only the average on unemployment is two sixty nine I think a week. I mean, two sixty nine. Think about that. What really could that would it pay your mortgage in New York City? Hell no. <laughs> two sixty nine a week. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So how did? But by the way, so that's the really interesting part of this drama as we tell this story. How did you get that MSNBC job? Because God, that's a great you know leap up, as you said. Uh, how did that work out? Well, so I came and interviewed. My agent had set up an interview, and I had a, a really un agent who I just adore. And um, he set up an interview for me, and I came in, and there were some people who had been following my career and had seen me interviewing in other local market stations, and they wanted to see me do well, and they thought that I, you know, brought something different and, u- and unique to the table. And so I came in for one audition, and by the way, the MSNBC audition is a bear. It is probably one of the most stressful 10 minutes I've ever been through in my entire life. It's really difficult. They, they're talking in your ear and they're throwing crazy stuff in, at you and you know, you're know you just expected to juggle in ways that you've never done before. That's interesting because I, I didn't go through that at all because I, I guess I'm in a different category. Uh, well, but I'm fascinated <laughs> what, by that. What, there's an actual literal 10 minute audition where they just throw everything at you and then see how you're You're doing basically a block of news, and um, I'm probably telling state secrets here. I'm going to probably go in and they're going to say, listen, we would really prefer if you don't talk about the process, give everybody a hand. But, you know, it was, it was, it was nuts. It was like the, the craziest day of breaking news that you could ever come up with. And the things that they expected you to know in terms of, politics and world events and weather events in South America and you know they're, they're throwing all this stuff at you and you have to ad lib around it as though you have a great handle on what you're talking about and um, it was it was stressful and I you know I did know what I was talking about but I think at that period of the MSNBC they just felt like you know I was bringing something a little bit different to the table and they were willing to take a risk on a, on a woman who had been unemployed for 10 months and then had been in local news before that in market 34 and but that first year on the job at MSNBC was really it was an uphill climb you know you, it really took some time for me to figure out what's this about what am I doing here you know how do I assimilate in something that was very different from the half hour newscast I was accustomed to yeah and, um, and now you know I, now I love it and I, it would be hard for me to give that up I think that that story is in some ways reassuring to people because you know they really run you through the ringer and your whole story I think is gives people a, a really interesting perspective they had to know every nuts and bolts of you know of of TV you know whether it's the, uh, operating the camera editing etc so that when you get to where you are in a sense you're the complete package and Yeah but do you know how annoying I must be to the people we work with because imagine I show up to my show and I'm like well, this should be produced differently, and I know because I've been a producer. And this should be edited differently because I know I I was a I was an editor. And why is this shot this way? I know I was a photographer. You know, so, like every step of my show, I'm uh, micromanaging things. And even when I'm on the air, what people can't see is half the time I'm doing sign language to my director. You know, where is this the ambient noise on this tape? How come? We're showing a demonstration, but I can't hear the people shouting. 
um, we're at a sports event, but I'm not hearing the rah-rahs in the background. Or I'm telling the camera guy, you know, I, I'm wrapping up here, but I want a full shot on my face when I come out because I've got something serious to say. And my producers, I know, are sitting in the control room going, oh, my, you know, can't she just do her job and we'll do ours? Right. All right, Contessa, we got to have you back on. Uh, this has been great conversation. Uh, t tell everybody when, when they can watch you on MSNBC. I'm on every day at noon Eastern, 9, p 9 a.m. Pacific time. And don't forget, on Sundays, I have a special show, Car on Camera, that airs for three hours. Um, from I think it's from 4 to, uh, 4 to 8 Eastern time, or... I, I'm getting getting confused about the Eastern Time Pacific Time. I, uh, three hours on Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. All right, that's excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, Contessa. We loved it. Good to talk to you. I appreciate it. See you at work. All right, <laughs> excellent. Thank you.